Welcome to the Search for Sustainability documentary series. My name is Nathan Crane, and I had the joy and the delight and the pleasure to travel the country with my wife and my daughter and get to explore, interview, connect with, and learn from nearly 50 people of all walks of life, all focused on living a more sustainable life here on planet Earth. We got to interview politicians, business owners, green environmentalists, sustainability experts, and so many others from school teachers to schools to eco villages and communities to just regular people like you and I that they're doing amazing things on the planet, including permaculturists, master herbalists, and so many others. And the information we learned from them was truly life-changing. So while it was able to enhance and improve and completely change the quality of our lives and the direction of our lives, I realized that it was information that could change other people's lives as well. And rather than just turn it into a single short film, you know, we have nearly 40 to 50 hours of content, we decided to turn it into a 12 episode documentary series because there's so many facets of sustainability that most of us just don't know about you know we talk about sustainability and we usually think about the ecology which it certainly is an important part of sustainability but there's so many other viewpoints of sustainability such as relationships our own physical health business economics politics community and then of course food production water and so on and so we go into multiple facets of sustainability and, and look at what does it mean to truly be sustainable and how do we not only get to sustainability but then how do we thrive as an individual as a family as a community and as a global collective you see the term sustainability means something that can continue indefinitely and if we look at most of our systems today we recognize that they're either falling apart, crumbling, crashing, or trying to be renovated, but it's just not happening. And so we realize most of those systems, economic system, financial system, education system, political system, and so on, healthcare system, and on and on and on, are not sustainable. Why? Because they cannot last the way they are indefinitely. So we need to explore better options, better solutions. We need to understand what the challenges are. We need to go into depth about these different challenges. So no matter where you're at on your journey of sustainability, you have a deeper understanding and then we can dive into the solutions. So each episode, we go deeper and deeper and deeper into specific facets of sustainability from multiple perspectives, from multiple people and the power it has to inspire you, to uplift you and to give you real practical solutions to change your life is beyond anything I've ever experienced in my life. And so on behalf of myself and my family and everybody who's a part of this documentary series, we want to welcome you, thank you, honor you, and appreciate you for joining us, watching this, and tuning in, and most importantly, sharing it with everybody you know, inviting your friends, your family, your community, your schools, your churches, the organizations you're a part of, to watch it with you, because that is how we make a true lasting impact and difference for the positive future of our experience here on planet Earth. So again, thank you for joining us and let's begin.
Human civilization is headed for a sustainability collapse at many levels, whether you're dealing with uh, soil, topsoil, water, fossil water, the aquifer water, also global financial systems, debt systems. You have so many layers where humanity is using up everything and not really thinking carefully about how we can make this sustainable. How do we save seeds? How do we run on a post-fossil fuel economy? How do we grow food when the water aquifers have run out? These are the key questions that humanity is facing right now. The way we have pursued life in the Western world um, is not a sustainable model. Um, you know, it's a, it's a dead-end road. And I think at some level we all know it. You know, um, some are better to ignore it than others. Um, I've tried to ignore it for a number of years. Uh, but when you really start to look at the way we um, we use the planet's resources um, and the way we, um, we deal with our own self-development um, in the process throughout life. I think what we see is that there is a, there's a deep level of insecurity in our Western world. And I think it actually starts with being cut off with our ties with nature. There are a lot of impacts on our planet from from all of the products that we're consuming, all of the um, things that you can buy and throw away, um, all of the pollution that's being put into the air and to the water through all of our consumption. Um, and people are losing contact with each other as well. And they're losing contact with the earth and with our, the preciousness of our resources. You know, people take for granted just, oh, you turn on the lights and it comes on. You, open the, you op open the faucet and water comes out. Why would you need to turn it off, you know? So, um, but, so our natural environment suffers from that. But what I think is more important, because I feel that the earth is very resilient, you know, She's gone through many ice ages and she's dealt with more than us over time. And I know that she'll live through this big transition time we're going through, but we're missing out on this beautiful connection with the earth. If we recognize that what we live in and this construct that we live in is this an illusion that's actually created to really, at the end of the day, it's very much like the matrix where uh, the Morpheus character says, that, um, that when the veil comes down and then you realize that you, you're a slave, Neo, that, you know, that we've constructed a society and where we're all slaves, slaves to wage slaves, stuck in our positions, stuck in jobs that we can't stand, doing things that we hate, bombarded with information that keeps us docile, that keeps us uh, feeling that we have no power, but we have all of the ultimate power that we need to change this overnight, but we're not doing it. The systems we have in place go down to the detail where when we sit in a classroom, we normally sit in a square room, right? The teacher is on only one side of the room where the blackboard or the whiteboard or the screen or whatever is. And we learn to look for direction only from that one spot in the square. And it perpetuates, literally, it, it puts lines in our brain. If I could, I mean, neurologists have explored this and have proven this. It patterns us in these square systems of thinking where we're always in our rank. And if we're back here in our rank, it is very difficult for us to get to a different rank even today, where we think, you know, the dishwasher can become the millionaire, um, it still doesn't really work because that's why, that's why people go broke after they win the lottery, because they cannot handle being in a different spot in that hierarchy. 
I think humanity suffers from a dangerous mindset of really short-term selfish thinking where we're not thinking four generations ahead or ten generations ahead. We tend to be preoccupied with what's here right now, how can we survive or how can we profit in a selfish way rather than thinking about, well, what about our children, our grandchildren? What can make human civilization sustainable for a thousand years rather than make profits for our corporation for the next quarter? You see, we have corporations running the system today. Corporations dominate food and energy and banking and finance. These corporations are not thinking about long-term sustainability. They're thinking about shareholder profits for the next quarter or the next meeting or the next round of investors coming in and, and giving them money. They are not focused on what we need as a civilization to still exist and still be here in 100 years or 500 years or 1,000 years. Those answers are completely opposed to the way corporations operate today, which is really a rape and pillage exploitation of the planet and of the people at the same time. The commercial food supply is toxic. You just don't want to eat what's, what's coming out of the grocery store or being sold in restaurants. It's just not good for the human body. So I feel like right now it's the, a vital time for people to start focusing on sustainability because of the way our culture and our world is shifting. Um, we're seeing a lot of instability in, in markets. You can even watch the last couple years, watch the food prices, how they shift. Right now I know in some areas of the country, eggs, are, there's shortages of eggs, there's rationing of eggs, the prices are going up because of the different um, bird diseases. We had that last year with the pork diseases. And so uh, I'm not saying necessarily growing your own food will completely insulate you from all of that, but it insulates you from a lot. So when everyone else on online or Facebook is talking about how much they paid for eggs, I just go out to the chicken coop and there they are. So I'm not saying it's easy necessarily to grow your own food or it just comes you know, without any effort. But absolutely, I think people, now is the time to start learning how, you know, learning where your food comes from, learning how to even just do little things. If you live in an apartment, grow something on your balcony. Um, just take a more active role in that because our, we do live in an unstable society right now. Things are shifting and you never know when that's going to become a lot more important um, or when the grocery stores aren't going to be as available. No more room for unsustainable lifestyles and practices. And so literally we're being forced that way. And we can see the planet is rebelling. And so we, we, it's, we're getting a warning. And so that's, that's why. But that's one level. The spiritual level is we're meant to be sustainable. Okay, and from my Native American background, I'm thinking, you know, the whole training, oh, metaculacin to all my relations, is to live in proper harmony with every level of life. It's just the way you're supposed to be. Okay? Then the Europeans come and they're completely unsustainable and, and the Native Americans don't even know what to do with that. And so, what's wrong? Okay. Now, we're talking Europeans, but I know that when we go back into biblical times, they did live in a sustainable way. Well, there's lots of different layers to what sustainability is. You know, when I think about sustainability, I first think about, like, what's first? What are, we, what are we drinking? What are we eating? How are we living? What does our lifestyle look like in every, you know, way? How are we walking through this land? How are we caring for each other? How are we caring for the earth? You know, it's, it's all, it's all, you know, it's all plays its role in a deep way. And so it's really about you know changing uh, how we live so we can continue to live uh, health healthfully and into the future. You know, when we're talking about the planet, we're speaking about our mother and returning to our mother. So, you know, I feel like the hearts of the people are broken, and for those of us who have ours whole, it is our job to uplift those and, and help those repair, so they can have that self-sustainable happiness. <laughs> that we all seek. I believe that you can't talk about sustainability unless you're talking about homegrown food. The two are, are hand in hand. In our current system here in the United States, 
It takes 10 calories of energy to get one calorie to your lips. That is clearly unsustainable. So yeah, it's great that you got a Prius and it's nice that you got fluorescent light bulbs, but where the rubber really meets the road is starting to grow your own food and that's what really makes a difference. Right now in our culture, we have food that, never mind being raised with chemicals and things like that, we have food that people never touch. You can plant and raise and harvest whole fields of grains and corns and stuff with tractors that are run by GPS. I mean, no human is even involved in that. And I think we really miss something in that. We really, that something is left out. It isn't meant to be raised mechanically like that. It's, it's food that has no vital life force in it. And I feel bad about those poor plants that have to live through something like that. That's not, that's not how nature meant it to be. We know that hundreds and hundreds of acres of rainforest are destroyed every year for the cattle, mainly the cattle industry, and for mining in addition, and sometimes chicken, but it's mostly the cattle industry. And that's clearly not sustainable. When the rainforest is gone, I would hate to think if that actually happens, we don't have air to breathe. And when that happens, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that we're out of planet here. We're, our, our life is doomed. We're, we're done. At least humans will be eradicated from the planet. Maybe other species can survive and it'll start all over again. But humans are gone. And so I believe that all of us need to step up and do what we can right here, right now to change that and be the change that we need to see on the planet to prevent that from happening. I believe at this point, uh, we all need to uh, be in control of our own systems that maintain us and specifically our health but also our living environments but our health is a big one being in control of our own food supplies is very large the nutritional quality of our foods has been plummeting um, it's something that can be studied and measured and it's becoming well known that the nutrition of our foods coming from a monocrop based system is lacking a lot of nutrition. I mean anyone can go into a grocery store and pick up a tomato and be aware that that tomato probably isn't very tasty but if you grow your own tomatoes in your own garden they're probably the most delicious thing you've ever tasted. More people are discovering that food plays an important role in our health, but what's, what's not as well known is, is the way we grow food has a direct impact to both climate change and the health of our oceans and our health of our soils. And carbon farming or regenerative agriculture is a, is a new way to look at farming where we, uh, where one of the goals is to take the carbon that's in the atmosphere. We have too much carbon in the atmosphere. We can return that and put it back into the soil. So we can literally take the carbon that's up in the atmosphere in the ocean we have too much of and we can cycle it back into the soil through regenerative agricultural practices such as composting, cover crops, um, planting more trees, uh, planned grazing, and working with nature instead of against nature. And literally, if we don't do it, we're going to acidify the oceans, and they provide two-thirds of our oxygen. So this is like literally like a 911 for uh, the health of, uh, of, of the planet. I think everyone should have some part of a role in where their food comes from. Whether that's going and working at a community supported agriculture uh, setup, or you're going to your farmer's market and meeting your farmer and learning about where the food comes from, or you're growing it in your backyard, I think it's really important. I think we as humans need that connection to our food. Um, and that really, that really is an important part of what we're doing. I come from a family of sharecroppers and black panthers. And so the whole activism side around like how we can include food as medicine was all about how we can save bills and also go back to the roots because a lot of Africans in America were brought to the continent to just do that. And then when the conversation was started, they kind of felt like it was beneath them to provide for themselves, but it became like the strongest way that we can really stand up to the system is actually through providing through us and for ourselves. Really? It's like straight up, bro. Like, 
Um, I said you can eat a seed or you can plant it too yeah, man. and have a million. Everyone has to eat. Everyone eats, everyone eats every day. And one of the largest industries has been built around producing that food, delivering that food, storing that food. One of the fastest steps to sustainability is for every single person to work toward the sustainability of our food chain. So here's a great story about why soil is so important. When I first started growing food, I put some seeds in the ground, just like the, the packet said, and I was watering it. And uh, it was the fall, and my broccoli came up, and it wasn't looking that great, but it was broccoli, and it was okay. And then we had that first cold snap, and my broccoli died. And I was so disappointed, because, you know, broccoli is supposed to be able to handle a frost or a freeze, right? And I'm like, why did this happen to me? And so over a long period of time, visiting with the best gardeners around me and organic farmers, I began to understand what the principle was. I was just growing my broccoli in the sand that I had. And my neighbor, who had fantastic broccoli that was big and beautiful and green and bursting with life and laughing at the ice crystals, was growing in two feet of composted horse manure. I mean, those broccoli plants had everything they could possibly want, nutrition and life and biology that they could possibly need, and they were vibrant and healthy. Now, the thing about it is, is when you grow food that's in nutritionally dense and rich and vibrant soil, those plants get all those vitamins and minerals and growth in it and vibrancy, and then when you eat those plants, that's what happens to you. You start to become much more vibrant and alive and you get those minerals. We all know that if you don't have vitamin C you get scurvy. You know if you don't get the B vitamins you're going to get pellagra. We do know about vitamin deficiencies are the causes of diseases. That's a very clear understood scientific thing. Where you're ultimately going to get all those minerals and vitamins is going to be from the soil. So soil and growing soil is absolutely vital. It's, it's, just, it's just the foundation of sustainability. You really can't talk about sustainability without talking about growing soil. A lot of people uh, often ask, do, do I need a soil test? And, um, and I'm like, sure, you can get a soil test. And it'll tell you that your soil's alkaline and needs organic <laughs> matter. <laughs> it'll tell you that it's clay and needs organic matter. <laughs> You know, and, and so the solution to whatever test you get, whether you have, actually, if you have high acidity or, <laughs> or, or high alkalinity, or it, it add organic matter. <coughs> and so um, it really is a, a cure-all. And so we started to have regular meetings, ranchers and enviros, and um, we called ourselves the 6-6 six, six group for six of us and six of them, or six one, half a dozen of the other, however you want to do it. And the, we were meeting in a carport, like I said, in Phoenix, but it, it fairly uh, quickly became obvious that why are we doing this? Well, and the ranchers who came were ranchers who were really proud of what they were doing on the land. So they started inviting us to have our meetings out on the land. So here we are going on the land, and they're taking around and showing us what they're doing, how they're managing their ranches, and I'm finding out that the ranchers know a hell of a lot more about the land than I do as an environmentalist, and I'm trying to put them out of business by getting them off the land. I, and in essence, I was finding out that I knew very little about what I was talking about. They knew a lot. And they showed us some things that were really surprising. So from that, uh, I started visiting ranches around the West and uh, wrote a book about ranchers who were doing really exceptional stuff like this. You know, one ranch in Mexico, uh, where the guy was just doing incredible things, getting the land to come back, and we compared his ranch with the ranch next door. Uh, and it was like night and day. I mean, his cowboys are standing in grass up to their nose, and the ranch next door is almost as bare as a tabletop. So we went to ranches around the West, saw projects like this, but in the process, I also started visiting preserves. And I'm beginning to notice that the ranches I'm looking at are a whole lot healthier looking than the preserves. They got more growing on them. They're, obviously, the land is more vital. There's the more, more uh, of a functioning water interchange between the land and the plants and the soil. And uh, so I, I'm beginning to wonder. I wrote that first book. It was called Beyond the Rangeland Conflict, Toward a West That Works. 
And one of the chapters was about the ranch we're sitting on now, the Orm Ranch, because some of the people here were really, the people I knew here who were managing the ranch, the Kesslers, were really involved in learning how to do a better job on the land and also about bringing people together. We grew up at a time when Victory Gardens was the thing. And the president said, hey, we're at war, everybody needs to grow their own food. Guess what? Two million Victory Gardens went in in one year. That's all it took. And so I grew up at a time where every backyard, even though my father commuted to New York by train, you know, just across the river, we were in New Jersey, we had half a dozen to a dozen chickens and we had a garden. Uh, so, you know, sustainability in wild edibles is as simple as just seeing what's in your environment and reducing energy, the energy it takes to pick and eat something to a bare minimum. You know, I, I walk out my back door, I open the door, there it is, there's the food. That's way more sustainable than getting in a car, driving across town, buying food that was shipped from thousands of miles away. I just save lots of fuel and energy right there. It's, it's super simple to grow your own food. You know, my job is uh, as a steward of my land, you know, to take care of my microbes, to take care of my plants. And the whole trick to gardening, and some people might think, oh, John, I got brown thumbs. The whole thing to gardening is that the plants, they know what to do. Every little seed is encoded genetically with, you know, I don't know, prana, chi, energy, life force, and in, and in intelligence. Where if you plant it, you put it in the ground, you give it some water, it knows it needs to sprout. You don't need to tell, tell it, like, I'm putting you in the water, you need to sprout and grow me food. It knows exactly what to do. Like, if you get into bed with somebody of the opposite sex, or the same sex, if you're into that stuff, you know what to do. You don't need to be told, like, this goes there and that goes there, right? And so it's really easy. All you need to do is set, up, set it up. So, like, you know, having a good bed in the evening is a good place. But in the garden, you need to set it up properly, have good soil, you know, have proper watering and all this kind of stuff. And nature works, right? Nature works, and it's that easy. So don't have these mental blocks that you can't do it. Nature knows what to do. Actually, all we really need to do is get out of the way. If you walk outside, there's just weeds coming up and all this stuff, and nobody's planting them. They're just coming up, they're doing what they need to do. So you really need to set up a good system and then just step back and watch it grow. So um, I like the idea of, of permaculture systems because if you plant them well and you do a good job, you're giving a gift to your future self. If you do it really well, you don't have to do anything other than harvest in the future. You don't have to irrigate, you don't have to fertilize, you don't have to worry about pests. You just harvest. Now, granted, you can get your plot of land to produce four times more if you go in and monkey with it, but you also have the be lazy option. That solves, and, and it, it solves so many of the world's problems around hunger or starvation or dying of starvation. Um, and it's all a matter of getting the information out. And it's been demonstrated to work all over the world. And just a, a little description of what permaculture is, because I know not everyone knows that word. Uh, it really originally was two words put together, uh, permanent and agriculture. Uh, as a way of how can we have a sustainable food production system? How can we grow our food uh, sustainably? But as we got to know more about sustainable food production, we really understood that permaculture needs to mean permanent culture because there's a lot, a lot more to sustainability than only food. Food's a really important part, but there's energy, there's water, there's community, there's economics, there's all these pieces. The Institute uh studies how uh, we can integrate human beings into natural systems or the reverse of that which would be integrating nature into human systems there's actually two concepts that we deal with <clears throat> the first is um, integrated closed-loop production systems and if you are closing your production loops you are producing all of your inputs as a part of the production cycle so that you can reduce your cost of input to zero. If you are integrating your production cycles, um, you're uh, using all the products of each process, any byproducts, as feedstock for other processes, and that will reduce your waste to zero. So that, that's the essence of sustainability. 
and we're looking at how do we, what does a uh, suburban sustainable habitat look like. This sometimes seems so futile. We grow a big cover crop, graze it down with a sheep, till it multiple times with a tractor to gr put wimpy plants in here that we have to baby to eke out a crop. You know, and these are on their way, they'll grow, there's gourds and peppers, summer squash, but it's so much effort weeding and everything. You look over, look at the difference over there. We, all we got to do is just kind of like water it and, but we don't even have to water it that much because it's, it's not evaporating. This soil, once you open up the soil, it's just opening it up to drying out and it's a very foolish thing. A lot of agriculture is really, the way we're doing it in a modern way is very foolish. In the United States, unfortunately, it's very common in today's day and age that as a person gets older, they end up relying on pharmaceutical drugs or they become incapacitated in some way or Alzheimer's statistics are through the roof. From 2000 to 2010, Alzheimer's is up 68%. This is a new phenomena. Where I live in Vilcabamba, Ecuador, the 90-year-olds are working in the fields with the 20-year-olds and outdoing them because now the 20-year-olds are getting Americanized. But this is like a sustainable lifelong approach that these elderly are doing who live to be over 100 years old. They're living off the land, they're tilling the land. When my wife was pregnant with my daughter, Araya, we went to go visit a 92-year-old Ecuadorian doula just so she can uh, check her, um, Angela out to make sure everything was okay. And as I was driving up to the house, all of a sudden I saw her like way down the street and I'm looking at her and she has this huge sack of beans on her shoulder and she's sitting here walking up with no issue whatsoever. She must have walked over a mile with it. And I'm like, I see her, I'm like, whoa, what do you, let me help you with that. What are you doing? Come on, put that down. So she puts the bag of beans down and the girls go in and do their doula thing. So I'm sitting there, all right, I go pick up this bag. And I'm like, whoa, this thing was seriously like 150 pounds. I seriously almost wanted to call her back to help me bring it in. But I sat there and I dragged it all the way to the door. So these people who are living off the earth are living literally till over 90, 100 years old. It's known as the land of longevity. I had a, I was stricken with spinal meningitis, which was caused by a complement immune deficiency. And the doctors in the hospital told me that I might not make it out alive at that point. So at that point, that's when I really started valuing my health above any kind of monetary wealth. And, you know, we're all taught in the society oh, to be, you know, um, successful. You need to be rich and to have the most money. But that's not success, in my opinion, because there's plenty of famous people with tons of money who commit suicide all the time because they're just simply not happy, not living their true life, not doing what makes them feel good, empowers them. So I'm glad that I'm able to find this. Plus the problem with a lot of the rich people is that they're just not eating a healthy diet. And I think above all else, even people that have the most money, even if they don't want to grow their own food, like I'm showing you guys how to do that, and to grow the best quality food, because you're worth it because you are what you eat and absorb. Now, the other part of that is you want to, it's much safer to eat lower on the food chain because the animals are gathering the meat fish, the, the fish and the chicken and the cows uh, have somewhere between 15 and 30 times more pesticides, herbicides, and radiation. Big deal. Well, for your health, it's a big deal. So what we're seeing, again, is, is the research shows 95 to 96 percent of the exposure to pesticides, herbicides, toxins, chemicals, radiation, is it meat, fish, chicken, and dairy? And you, let's take it closer to home. A, the milk from a, a vegetarian woman who's breastfeeding has 1% of the pesticides and herbicides as a, the milk from a, from a uh, meat-eating woman. So sustainability is a big deal because you can't sustain yourself on toxins. doesn't really work. Genetic engineering has introduced a new level of unsustainability. Just been talking about, obviously, if there's, it's creating some foods that are risky, that's not very sustainable. If it's creating environmental degradation, which it is, that's not sustainable. But even there's another layer of unsustainability that I think bears 
bears our attention, and that is the new level is ethical unsustainability because my book demonstrates that the genetic engineering venture is incompatible with truth-telling. I mentioned earlier that these foods initially became commercialized only because the U.S. Food and Drug Administration lied. It actually defrauded the public here and the world, told lies, covered up the key evidence, and unfortunately, the groundwork for the FDA's fraud had been laid for many years before that by eminent scientists and scientific institutions. That, that disinformation campaign on behalf of genetic engineering began years before the technology could even successfully be applied to, to plant life. And it has continued since the FDA's fraud. So year after year, we, the public, have been inundated by statements that are actually false coming from eminent scientists and scientific institutions. And it's clearly documented in my book, solidly documented, that there have been systematic frauds perpetrated on behalf of genetic engineering and that this venture has been chronically and crucially reliant on such deception. Companies like Monsanto, the whole idea of genetically modified organisms, that's something of the 21st century. It's to monetize and to patent a seed so then you would charge other farmers because they need to use your seeds because their farm is growing your seeds and you're going to charge them money for it and put them out of business. It's a horrible system, but it's a system of greed. It's based off of profit and it's based off of, you know, trying to uh, take over and have more power. And that, that equals in politics because you have more power in politics, more money, more funding. So it's, it's very screwed up, but I think what we can do, because I don't like to focus on the negativity, I like to focus on what can we do right now. So I like to focus on the education, knowledge. Knowledge, knowledge is power. Going out there and educating people, telling people about it, having conversations about it is huge. Because most people, if you walk on the street and ask people on the streets, what are GMOs? Unless you're outside of Whole Foods, most people are so busy trying to pay their bills, they don't know what GMOs are. They're like, it's $2, I'm going to buy this. So that's where education comes in, and that's why I'm so passionate about what I do, because I know that if you know better, yes, you're probably going to do better. It is more expensive. They made it more expensive to eat healthier and getting, you know, really, really high quality food, but it's, you're going to pay and pay for it in the long run, you know, if you um, don't take care of yourself and then all the medical bills come on. So it's like a different cycle. And it turns out that um, having been among native people for 40 years now, I, I remember times when virtually every family had their own farm and their own herd of sheep, and it was all organic. There was no other type. <laughs> it wasn't like some people had organic and some people had pesticides. Everybody was organic. And um, that changed so much over the past 40 years that now we really need to do something to re-engage local farmers and growers. Our hope with our school, as an example, is we can reach out to the local farmers and growers and indeed show them how we're growing our own food year-round through our greenhouses and encourage the farmers to get engaged in growing with greenhouses year-round so that they can sell their produce to other schools. We think that is sustainable. If people could realize that in many ways their happiness is linked to the health of the planet, the health of their neighbor and their own personal health, it doesn't matter if you've got a million dollars in the bank and you have no health, you might as well have zero in the bank. Okay. Your health is probably one of the most important things that you own and you need to safeguard it. Unfortunately, you can't rely on others anymore to look out for you. Our food is this weird stuff that's got stuff, you know, the chemicals in it, you can't even pronounce what they are. But if you put it on the shelf and come back a week later, it hasn't changed. There's something wrong with that, folks. <laughs> this is your, our food we're talking about. So you need to take personal responsibility for your health. That's more important than ever. You can't rely on corporations to do that because their motivation are profits. It's not your health. Uh, and then when you get sick, of course, there's other corporations that benefit off of that. So I think if we got back to being more grounded 
in terms of connecting with nature and being personally responsible for the health of our families and ourselves. If we got in, com in conversations like this, com converse with others, say, say, what are you doing for your children around sustainability? What are you doing for your own life around sustainability? You'll be able to awaken the inner connectedness I think we all have with nature. And people who've never thought about it, just when you ask the question, will start to say, hmm, I never thought about that, but now I gotta have an answer here. So I ask each person to take responsibility in their community, in their families first, with themselves probably, primarily, then with their families. Ask the question, what do we want to do as a family to be sustainable? And if they don't know the answer, the parents, the children will tell them. <laughs> and if I have anything to do with it, and I think, you know, the programs that, the programs that you're putting together have anything to do with it, the children will probably fill them in It's crucial that we understand where things are headed and that we understand the mathematics and the economics of this model that we're living under, which is resource extraction and exploitation. And it is a model that is, by definition, unsustainable. And this is um, really the defining crisis of our time. And we've got to step up and address it. And of course, um, as other populations in the world become more affluent. Um, they want for their families what Americans and Europeans have had for a long time. And uh, America needs to change in particular. We use a disproportionate share of the world's resources. And that, and that can't be sustained. And so teaching our students um, those things and how to live more lightly on the land, um, eating locally. We talk a lot about carbon footprint and how to reduce it. So that's, that's why it's more important than ever um, for us to be teaching these things. Our philosophy is to be a demonstration site of this kind of whole system transformation through this shift in consciousness. And our practice is a relational practice. Sometimes it's, we kind of call it a relational yoga. It's a way of really looking at how do we connect with each other by communication skills? How do we listen deeply? How do we speak more honestly and clearly about who we are and what our needs are? How do we work together in a win-win context where we're here to create something that's going to work for everybody when we have important decisions to make? And. Uh, so through communicating differently, through making decisions differently, through identifying uh, what is our vision, which is this global and local transformation, um, how do we go about doing that? And so it's a, it's a living laboratory. Sometimes we use that phrase to talk about ourselves. And, and uh, we're in the game. We're in the experiment. Right now, we're really focused on the energy question on the cloud because the cloud is actually, as you all know, is not actually in the sky, and it's not actually clean. It's not like a beautiful, uh, those beautiful white clouds on a, be a blue day. No, think of dirty gray clouds, uh, because all of the internet, all of the internet service companies, you know, our beloved Googles and Facebooks and so on and so forth, um, they've got huge server farms um, that use a lot of energy and a lot of water, and they need to be leaders in um, making sure that um, the, that that energy is carbon free and that they're being good um, stewards of water and good community stewards. We have somehow devolved, uh, as we've evolved technologically, we have devolved uh, and, and become separated from who we really are as, uh, as a species, both in terms of our planet and our connection there as well as with each other. I often say there is species intelligence and there is individual intelligence. Now in terms of individual intelligence, the human is, species is probably is arguably the most intelligent uh, life form on the planet, individually, arguably, and, and I understand that I, that is arguable, uh, but as a species, we are almost not arguably <laughs> uh, the least uh, intelligent species on the planet. A fire ant 
uh, colony. You can take a fire ant from here in Texas and you can take it to a colony in, in, in Florida and it will be treated as a fire ant. It's, it's arguably one of the largest organisms in the world if you see it that way. Uh, any, any animal, any virus even, knows how to uh, uh, sustain itself. A virus knows, has enough intelligence to know not to kill its host. A virus does that. You look at uh, Ebola. There's five species of Ebola, right? Three of them are, are almost asymptomatic. Two of them have a, a high mortality rate, 60 to even 90%, depending on, on where you're at in terms of your environment and your healthcare environment. Uh, those viruses, those Ebola viruses, are mutating madly. And the reason they're mutating madly is to get away from being deadly because viruses generally don't like anything greater than about a 5% mortality rate. It means that they're not going to survive. So even a virus, and, and people will say, well, a virus isn't a life form. And I will say, well, if that's true, then human beings are actually, as a species, lower intelligence than something we're saying is not even a life form. So what does that tell you about us? I think f for us, a community forklift, bringing together a visionary understanding that we are here really to create a different kind of world. We want to live in a different kind of world. We want to be part of a different kind of world. And we can cr begin to create that world today. So when you start that organization, you start your, your path and you put one foot in front of the other, having a sustaining vision of understanding that direction that you're moving in and that you're changing things. And changing things is going to mean that some people aren't going to agree with you and that, in fact, you know, the system maybe isn't the system we want to be part of. And that's what we have to change. We have to change these much broader systems. But it can happen on this very organic level of engagement in the community. And that's what we've done here. And to tell you the truth, that is, it is so thrilling to come down and see you know, people coming together and people excited about what they can make happen in this community. So the point to all of this is that as you start to think about sustainability and get excited about doing this on your own, you know, it, it's, it's important to uh, recognize, number one, the community side, and, and that'll help you in a couple of ways. One is, it'll keep you from becoming overwhelmed, because there's just a lot of information out there. And a lot of people are like, well, where do I start? Oh my God, you know, I, I this, and I got that, and I, you know, and, and especially, you know, what I've just been talking about. We've got herbs, and we got blacksmithing, and we got tactics, and we got, you know, building, green building, and all this stuff. Um, where do I start? And uh, the community aspect of this allows you to be comfortable with just working on a small piece that excites you. I always tell people when they're learning about something like herbs where there's just a vast plethora of information, of data, to find what excites you, you know, and that's how you learn. So just find a little piece that excites you. It's sort of like when you talk about prepping. People are like, oh my God, how do I prep for a year, you know, I can't, I don't even know where to start. We'll start with 24 hours, right? I mean, that's, you know, right? <laughs> like the old joke, how do you need to eat an elephant one bite at a time? You know, but you break your task down from large into small and do one task at a time. We at least have to try to expose ourselves to communities where that is lived. It is impossible to restructure our physical brain just by thought and intention. So only when we live it can we actually physically become this new paradigm. And for sustainability, which needs us as co-responsible beings for the planet. And we have now shown that we are entirely co-responsible because not only have we invented weapons that can destroy the planet many, many times over, and some of them have been dismantled because of our anti-nuclear efforts and those of Helen Caldicott and others, but we still have to recreate a new type of structure, a new kind of philosophy that manifests itself and can be lived. How do you get from competition to contribution? Where does it influence us? Everywhere. In our marketplace, well, this is cheaper, no, this is better, no, this is greater, no, this is lower, this is higher, my building is taller than your building, my, it goes on, my car is bigger than your car, it has more horsepower, you know, you name it. It is everywhere. And to change that will take quite a while. 
that is not to say that we shouldn't all try wherever we are. And that's why I also very much promote to recognize wherever communities or individuals or families are making strides. The time that we are living in, you see a lot of traditions um, being lost. A lot of cultures, indigenous cultures, really struggling um, to survive and, and just to exist even. And, um, and so, you know, part of my prayer in carrying these songs is that they, they carry the, the energy from that time and they, they actually are a bridge um, to, to this time. And, and not only um, are they a bridge, but that by singing them, we keep those songs alive and we keep that essence alive in this time. Um, and of course we can't go back and nor do we want to, but I think, you know, kind of looking back as to how humanity has evolved over time and what things our ancestors did that maybe we've somehow forgotten about that maybe need to be revitalized and brought back into this time. Um, and songs are one way to do that, you know. I love that, that theme of how music transcends time as a, there's a cultural resonance that's, that connects us to the, you know, primal nature of our humanity. And they said, if, you know, there's a tribe in Africa that says, if you can walk, you can dance. If you can talk, you can sing. Anywhere in the world you go, there's a fire, there's a drum, there's a song, there's a heartbeat. So, you know, we want to bring that universality, um, transcend religion or even the ideology of spirituality and, and just ground it in the most human way, you know, and so our songs are carrying just a universal vibration. We're not here to push any one way on anyone. I, you know, I, I have mixed feelings about even branding our music as sacred music. We, we want it to be accessible. We really feel that we've, we've encoded our music with that kind of vibration, but that it's accessible enough for, for all people. And we hope that, you know, people experience it that way too, that no one feels like they're being preach to or something and we just we're just passionate about the changes that we're seeing on the planet and inviting people to step into their their purpose within that that greater scene being involved in the community has literally changed my life the support team that i have is unbelievable the people who love you and reach out a hand and want to be there for you talk to you support you make food with you you become like family and it really is a very special thing i know for me personally it helped me to understand that it's not always just about the food, but the journey is so much greater. Not only do we have to do that work within ourselves, but it's reaching out and helping other people to do this as well. And it's just such a beautiful journey. I'm so grateful. <laughs> Humans need to find ways that connect us and build the structures that aid that need for connection and co-creation and co-responsibility, and it brings joy to life, and it's awesome. All of which feed back into this concept of a sustainable community that's based upon skills, that's based upon attitude, the proper attitude. We talk about the four A's of survival, attitude, right, adaptability, um, accountability, and um, um, uh, um, awareness. You know, it's the fourth one. So all these four A's really go together into being able to um, encompass what uh, we need to be able to do as a community to not only to survive, but to rebuild and to be something better than what we've been up till now, you know, the human condition. So the human condition isn't, isn't survival for us isn't to go and bury yourself in a bunker, shoot anybody who maybe trespasses on your land and wait for the Walmarts to rebuild. You know, that's not living, that's not life, and that's not what we were ever meant to be. Uh, the idea behind us is the survival of the human species in a way that is sustainable with the planet and that, that gives us a purpose on the planet. I mean, why are we actually here, not just from our standpoint, selfishly, but why are we here for each other and why are we here for the planet and what can we do to enable ourselves as caretakers of the planet in a way that, is, that really gives us purpose as a species as well. It's not only an ecological crisis, it's a spiritual crisis that we're going through. And what do they say about, you know, uh, crisis, challenge, crisis equals challenge plus opportunity. 
And so it's a breakdown to break through. So a lot of people at this time are having a spiritual crisis of some kind or another, or an awakening. They're starting to have access to abilities and sensations and feelings um, and knowing and intuit intuition and even psychic experiences that they might not have had access to before, which is partly because of the times that we're in. The, the energy is building toward this higher awareness. And so it's not unnatural for that to be happening. It's perfectly natural. And some of us who have been at it a little longer and we've already gone through a lot of our karmas and turmoils and figured out how to hold a field of love despite conflict and, and you know we can help others through as they're just starting to come into that awareness and that's I think a big part of what's happening energetically now and as each individual on the human earth team you know which is all of humanity right <laughs> as each individual steps more and more into the unconditional love that sees that for what it is and recognizes that each each human being is going to go through their own process with this awakening you know we can step back and hold it as like almost like an elder brother or sister you know and 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 help it'll be a little gentler and easier as people start start waking up to these higher energies so part of my communication always to this this unseen world is that i want my lessons in a gentle way and I, that's a powerful thing to know when we're communicating. I'd like to see people in the world thinking about how their thoughts, the traceability of their thoughts, have, um, have affected their environment. Whether those thoughts be very deep um, or, or relatively superficial and where those thoughts, what, what has manifested because of those thoughts. And I think if we can do it for ourselves, we can also do it as a community. Again, starting small, um, as nature does with a seed, can lead to enormous differences. And I am, I'm very much an, an optimist, even though that um, we've, we've, we're put in a very precarious situation. This is, to me, the key to sustainability. Am what I'm doing and is what I am eating, is how I'm growing my food, uplifting the planetary network of life. So I kind of ask that question, and am I sanctifying that process? We try to live that way at the Tree of Life uh, Center US and Tree of Life Foundation Gardens. So we, we ask that critical question, and it's critical for s real sustainability. If it's just material sustainability, it doesn't have that added dimension of a, of a spiritual overview. Yeah, we're all connected, we're all one. And when you're really operating on it, rather than intellectually operating, it's a really, it's a different experience. I believe that we have, we have come into a, an era where, uh, where people are starting to wake up. Uh, that we just can't do more of the same, we just can't keep going the way we have been uh, for the past, you know, 300 years, maybe longer. Uh, the reason I say 300 years, you know, it's, a, a, it's an interesting point in time when um, somebody stood up and said, you know, I think therefore I am. And I think the cut was uh, really a, a turnaround point for our uh, for our society. Um, I like to think um, differently and say, you know, I feel, and therefore I am. And I feel that there's a lot of people who start to come back to that motto uh, in their personal lives. And um, now the real challenge is how we can integrate that into our day-to-day -day lives, in the, in the roles we fulfill in society, that we, uh, we can put our whole selves into uh, what we're doing, and that we don't separate this from this here or that. So I feel like there has been a decline in the regenerative capacity of the earth and uh, that's very disconcerting. <laughs> and yet, the earth continues to nurture us. 
but we perhaps can't take for granted that it will do that forever. And that we have to give something back in order for that nurturing to continue. And indigenous people have said that for thousands of years and they've practiced that saying that if we're going to take then we've got to give something back otherwise the relationship eventually will stop. So maybe one way that we can go forward into a time where the earth has more regenerative capacity is to uh, begin giving back to the earth. Just if it's putting compost back into the soil, for example, after you've taken a crop of corn from the soil. Living sustainably is our obligation because the earth that we're living on, it isn't ours, it isn't disposable, this isn't a one-time use type of thing. We have to leave the earth better for the people who come after us than how we found it. Not just as we found it, because the generations that came before us really messed things up. They didn't quite get it. And so it's up to us here and now, not later, not tomorrow, not someone else, you and I, here and now, to do something about it. And the thing we do about it is real simple. We start to make better choices. We look at everything we consume and we ask, is it durable or is it disposable? If it's disposable, then we must reject it. Durable goods are part of sustainability and consuming less is part of sustainability. Being responsible with what you consume is the other half though. So why is it important to work on this now, why is it so urgent? Why do I get all excited about this? Because we have never been so close to the brink of self-extinction. Over these last 50 years, we have had more weapons on this planet, more nuclear power plants on this planet, the ability to destroy the entire planet several times, maybe even tens of times over. Of course, we would never know because it, we would be gone. Um, but theoretically, we have been minutes away from pressing that button as a human species. Of course, and never have we polluted our planet and never have we had the possibility to actually communicate around the globe like we can now. So I would like to say the advent of the carbon fuel age, which has developed all this technology, must be taken by its horns by us and turned into an advantage to humanity of ushering in this new way of working with each other. But the only way that we're going to be able to do this is if we all come together and decide that we want to stay here, we want to work together, we want to cooperate, and we want to build a better world that, that can, we can sustain so that our children have some place that they can look at and recognize that this is a place that they want to preserve. And so there you have it. We've just touched the tip of the iceberg. We've looked at different facets of sustainability and a lot of the issues that are going on in all of these different facets and these different sectors that affect all of our lives. And now it's time to focus on the solutions. Now it's time to make a stand and to decide for ourselves that we actually want to do something about this crisis that we're facing as a collective. And it's time that we want to inspire ourselves to come from that place of love and compassion and understanding and vibrancy and vitality so that we can create a community locally and globally that is focused on thriving and living abundantly without destroying this beautiful Mother Earth that gives life to all of us. And so now we have the opportunity these next 11 nights to dive deeply into each one of these facets around sustainability and to focus on and learn the practical solutions that we can take in our lives, in our schools, in our political systems, in our economic choices, in our own health and vitality, and in our children's lives, that will create a better future for all of us. So let us take a stand, let us make a declaration here tonight, together, 
that we will move forward as a community and make a vow to ourselves to make those changes necessary to create a better future for all of us. And so tomorrow night, I hope you're ready. This is one of the longest and biggest episodes because it's one of the biggest, most endearing and important topics for all of us to focus on right now, and that is food, soil, and water. Now these are our basic necessities for living as individuals and as communities and as a civilization. And unfortunately, they, they're all been being depleted all over the world. The beautiful thing is there are powerful solutions no matter where you're, whether you're in the inner city or you're in suburbia, you're in an urban area or you're on a farm, there are powerful solutions that you probably don't even know exist that will give you security, independence and interdependence in all of these areas. So I look forward to seeing you during tomorrow night's episode. And until then, please share this with your friends and your family. Get everybody you know involved and invited to participate in this series because this is how we're going to make a true difference and impact in our communities and all around the world. See you tomorrow night. Riding the galloping horses, riding the galloping horses.